your character is the first asset you have. Your reputation is the first asset you have as an entrepreneur. Mm. A lot of young people don't have it. Mm. So when they tell you, when the moment your money passes from your hand and gets to their hand, they start remembering that you are your uncle. True. They start believing that you have the SS. Mm. But then how many banks would you take their money and not repay back and they will give you back money? Another time. Hey guys, welcome to How They Did It with Trisha Biz, a show that takes you behind the scenes of successful African entrepreneurs, change makers, and creators, showing you the journeys that led to their success. This episode is sponsored by Traction Apps, the growth partner for your business. Nigeria has a budding population of over 200 million people, so one key industry that is significant for all of us is housing industry. And today I am live in Victoria Nest 3, one of the properties by the Netcom Oak Group. And I'll be interviewing the group managing director and founder of this multi-billionaire company, trying to understand how he started and business lessons for all of us. So we are live in another episode of How They Did It, and I have the honor of having with me Africa's biggest real estate mogul, aka founder and present GMD of Netcom Oaks, Dr. Kennedy Okonkor. Thank you very much. Nice Appreciate to have you here, sir. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so I've read a couple of articles about you. I have watched interviews, etc. And there's something that always stands out, you know, where you say growing up was hard. You know, but despite all of that, you turned out pretty well. You know, we see all the exploits that your company is undertaking in the market. How hard was hard? Okay, um, growing up was remarkably very, very hard. Mm. Very hard in terms of, um, let me take it from education. I attended a public school, I attended Lady Lack Primary School, and um, in a time when if your parents become a little bit wealthy, you, if your parents were a little bit wealthier, you would not be in the public school. Mm -hmm. So I attended a public school um, <clears throat> and uh, it was tough for my parents to be able to provide as small as test books, you know, for you to have them um, while attending school. So it was quite tough for us. Um, my dad used to go to the National Sports Commission then okay. to wash tanks, you know, when he gets those contracts to wash tanks, you know, to clean, he was a cleaner then, you know, you go clean tanks. Just imagine somebody that used to be an army officer, retired, you know, and then he needs to wash tanks to be able to buy school books mm. for his kids. So how hard could it have been? So. When you get to eat chicken or turkey, you know that it's actually a festive season. You know that it's actually like Christmas, mm. you know, or maybe Easter, and they are not guaranteed. So it was quite hard. And uh, by the time we moved on to Ikeja, the first glimmer of hope that we had was when my elder sister got married. And get, when my elder sister got married, um, her husband opened a store, a rest, you know, a store for my mom, okay. a canteen where she was um, selling food in the Kedja. And at some point in our life, that became our home. And so um, from then on, by the time my dad died and we lost the place that is supposedly home for us, which was a shop, okay. you know, shop. So you were living in the shop? We were living in the shop, shop daytime and... Um, bedroom night time mm. and so you you can't have the luxury of having a form to yourself or having a bed to yourself you are just all of us practically sleeping some lying as much as low as underneath what is supposed to be the table mm. in, the shop, in the shop being where you sleep and then on to when we lost that space and had to be under the Ikeja bridge for some time, 
but you know the luck i had as a person was that afterwards um someone gave me um a glimmer of hope he gave me the opportunity to live in his home okay and from then on a lot changed for me because the moment you put someone under a good roof his vision begins to change mm. and that's why i'm very passionate about the housing sector the real estate sector in nigeria because the quality of dreams and aspiration you have is determined by the kind of roof you have over your head if the rain is beating you every day where you're sleeping if you just imagine what it looks like to be one of those whose home is ravaged by flood and so when they need to get into their bedroom they need to you know step their foot into water to have a table that serves as bed you know for the night and so what kind of dream would such people have mm. what they, were your dreams when you were sleeping under the bridge uh, do i have dreams <laughs> my you know it was more like survival mm. because you wanted to wake up the next day hoping that things could turn out a lot better, better you than know? That and day. the truth is there's so little you could do. You, you see, um, the opportunity my cousin gave me, you know, um, to go to school changed a whole lot about my life. Because first and foremost, I have a good roof over my head. And then with that roof over my head, I begin to have better dreams. Mm. Don't forget, my cousin is a lawyer, you know, he's a businessman. He was busy attending board meetings here and there, you know, of companies that he belonged to, companies that he had stake in. So I began to see myself that if only I can work a little bit harder, all of my past can become erased mm. by my own efforts. And so I began to see myself as the man who can change his story if I do better. So my dreams began to change. So I began to visualize myself in a better place. Mm. Don't forget, I wasn't alone. You know, we had like 14 of us living with this man. 14? Yes. So, you oh, know, wow. so he, he uh, I knew that if I do very, very well, I'll have the opportunity to go to the university. Mm. And if I go to the university, you know, I will not end up like everybody who expected him to support them one way or the other with money for food, money for, for, for whatever needs they have. Mm. Some of us ended up going to the university. Some of us ended up trading. So don't forget also, I also had the opportunity of looking at, you know, looking after his store. You know, I was, you know, there with a couple of my cousins also at the store so every day you go out you go to the store so while still going to the store I was studying for my jam and the rest of them so by the time I did my jam exam and I was ready to go to the university I was nearly becoming a different man mm -hmm. because I understood the value of living on that roof. I went to the University of Ibadan. Um, don't forget, my parents were my younger ones and my elder sister and um, my mom were sheltered by a ch church. You know, there was a pastor, David, you know, who had a church just in the Wafeme Aula glass house complex mm -hmm. and you know they had a small space that they had for my mom and she was there while I went to the university you know while I lived with my cousin went to university so coming back from the university you know as a graduate you know in, um, in the year 2001 so um, I came out of the university and I needed to Place my mom and my siblings in a proper house. Mm. So at this time, they were staying in the church. They were staying in the church. Okay. So by the time I came out of school, I 
got them a place somewhere and funny enough for them to give you that place. Mm. Nobody wanted to rent out a home to a woman who didn't really have anything to do. I don't blame them either. And so looking for spaces here and there, looking for spaces here and there, you know, finally I was able to get a place and then we had to change name, you know. We had to, um, you, we had to, we had to, I had to claim something totally different, you know, because the landlord then didn't want to give a property to an Igbo man. So, mm. you know, I just reminded them, okay, my name is Kennedy Thompson. So I removed my father's, uh, name. I, my, my father's, I used my father's first name. Mm. And fortunately enough for us, he was in the telecom sector. And so we're beginning to see the, the, the rise of the telecom evolution in Nigeria, spearheaded by the telecom service providers. So in that space, I was one of those who could configure wireless internet for your telephone. And because the company you know, was providing prepaid calling card services, we're also distributing phones, fixed wireless telephone for the different operators we had in Nigeria then. It was mm. an industry on its own and it was booming quite well. That was before the advent of the GSM. So I worked a bit with my cousin. I was doing marketing, you know, um, for him. And afterwards I went to a human resource outsourcing company okay. where I worked. So my major breakthrough came when I moved to the human resource outsourcing company because, you know, when I sit back then, I realized that this company owned by one man was doing multiple things. They had a facility management division. They had a travels and tours company. They had a company that was doing cash management and cash movement. They had a company that was outsourcing security to the major banks in Nigeria. They, they, they also had a company that was outsourcing human resource to bank tellers and, you know, to banks, major banks in Nigeria then. So I will attend their school, I'll see, you know, how things were being run. And with that exposure, you know, when I was coming out, when I decided that I was no longer going to be in paid employment, I went back to my first love. And, you know, my first love was real estate because while I was doing, um, while I was working with my cousin marketing, I had the privilege of selling a property back then in VGC and I made a commission of about 280,000 Naira. Mm. And with that money, I was able to buy a vehicle in Nissan Sony 1988 model and I used the remaining 40,000 Naira to take care of myself in terms of fairly used clothes. And you bought a car? I bought a car. That was um, about 2002, thereabout. Okay. I bought a car then. I had a Nissan Sony 1988 model. So I had that car um, even when I started my, my work in Excel. You know, I had that vehicle. So I worked. Why did you buy a car though? Why not invest? Well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think it so much because here I was freelancing. Mm. Do you understand? I wasn't doing real estate. I just freelanced. And, and so I just felt my salary then was a copper. I was earning 6,000 naira copper salary. Mm. And then plus the allowance that the organization would give you. So what I was earning was, was was nothing near what I just made. So it was like money thrown at you from, from the heavens. And so mm -hmm. I didn't feel a need to invest. But, you know, I just realized that, that, that was one of the most stupid things I've ever done, you know. But if it didn't happen, I wouldn't understand the value that I can generate from the real estate industry. We we'll take always, the car. We will take the car, mm. we will go out with it and the rest of them. So I needed to say, I felt I could separate myself mm. by buying a car, you know, even though it wasn't the wisest of, of um, decisions. decisions. But when I rented the first house that I rented, that was within the Oniru property, um, Oniru 
you know, the Oniru Chieftaincy family had this land that they shared, small, small plots of land for their family members. Okay. And those family members didn't have the money to develop it. So you could sit down where you were living. I was living there then. I could see that somebody could come here and he, he, they would say this man is a mid-seller in motion or in one market somewhere and he's a developer. And so they were building bungalows, building bungalows upon bungalows. So I had the privilege, you know, I had the, the, the privilege of meeting some of those family members and they would be like, we don't have money to develop what we presently have. So everybody was busy because there were 30 year leases that the family, the king then had given to them, mm. you know, the former king, you know. And so they needed to develop because 30 years was running away. Mm. And, you know, some of them has lost, had lost about 10 years or thereabouts. So they brought it up. Some of them brought them to me. And so I started with developing those bungalows. Where did you get money to, for your first Very bungalow development? Questions. So typically what we were doing then was I'll go back to my colleagues at work and reach out to them, friends and family. Can I raise 500000 from you? By this time, my salary was slightly below... 80,000 naira. So I'll tell you, can I raise 500,000 naira from you? Mm. By the time I get two, three people, I'll tell them what the offer was for them. And so when they raise that money, we're able to go to site and I give them interest. Okay. Ridiculous interest for what mm. we were developing. And because I would take them to the site and I already had the agreements in hand, when I take them to the site, they'll be like, okay. Is this what you want to do? Okay, we'll give you this money. When would you give me? Here you are, you had young people who were working in Victoria Island and they wanted a place to call home, you know, not too far away. From their place of work? From their place of work. Mm. So you find them looking for somewhere very, very close by. And so that's where all of us live. And the funny part is a lot of you know, top celebrities that everybody knows today used to live in that place. Mm. You know, Noble Igwe was there back in the, day, in the days of Maomi, um, Joseph, you know, a lot of people, you know, mm. uh, even Timmy Tim Dakogo, you know, <laughs> all of us were practically in that environment. Mm. So that's where we started the journey. So we did our first set of bungalows there. We rented out. So from, from borrowing to build, mm -hmm. I started reselling when I realized I needed to move to the next level. I resold some of the leases that I had. So if a room of Palo self contained was renting at 550,000, 600,000 naira, and I have 10-year lease or 12-year lease out oh, yes. of that property. Mm. So I, I needed to you know, give you an offer that will make it irresistible for you. If Tricia had a good job and was living in this area, I'll just approach Trisha and say, Trisha, I have 12 years lease on the apartment Trisha is staying. Why don't you take this apartment and take it for about and take it for about 12 years? Mm. So instead of you paying 600,000 naira per annum that you used to pay, I'll give you at half the price. So Trisha gives me 3 million naira. So by the time I'm able to get 3 million naira from each of the apartment, I have lump sum. Mm. So with that money, I moved to other areas to go and start doing the build, operate, and transfer model also. Okay. So those houses were, the, you know, we're basically doing a build, operate, and transfer model. Build, operate, transfer. This is me interrupting your watch time to tell you to like this video, share it, and also subscribe to my channel. You're still watching How They Did It with Trisha B. Mm, so what do you say to entrepreneurs who are like, oh, I can't start the business because I don't have money? No, I don't think you, you, it's more of how do you market the idea? A lot of times, the things that we accomplish, we can have big ideas, but do we start small? Mm. I always believe in the first step. Many times, some of those projects that we are back upon, it's not because we had the whole money ready before we move. It's about the fact that when I call my uncle and say, give me 200,000 naira, let me invest it in this business. If he invests the 200,000 naira and I give the money back to him, 
tomorrow I'll go to the same uncle to give me two million. Uh, mm. He'll be willing to invest because over time Kennedy has been seen as credible. A lot of problems, I, I, the, the number of young entrepreneurs who collect money from people and don't bother returning it. And each time, you know, your character is the first asset you have. Your reputation is the first asset you have as an entrepreneur. Mm. A lot of young people don't have it. Mm. So when they tell you, when the moment your money passes from your hand and gets to their hand, they start remembering that you are your uncle. True. They start believing that you have the SS. Mm. But then how many banks would you take their money and not repay back and they'll give you back money another time? True. So it's not about you don't have money to start businesses. The first capital you would ever have is your reputation. It's your character. Mm. What are you known for? Are you the man who will deliver what he has promised? Okay, so you break into real estate, you know, you do the Oniru self contains. And how did you then move from Oniro to where the company is now, where you've built thousands of units scattered around Lagos? Okay, so um, ordinarily, I may not have moved very fast um, when we did the Oniro if um, certain things didn't happen. Okay. You know, I was, by the time we did the Oniro project, we were beginning to enjoy commissions that we were making from rentals that we were doing. And, you know, my company back then, while still in paid employment, I was earning a lot of um, brokerage fees, okay. closing out deals, you know, big deals. You want to let out your property, you reach out to me. You know, with the network that we had, we were getting corporate clientele. But we made the first mistake again. And that mistake was not understanding the title. So when we bought mm. a land somewhere in Songo Tedo, and that land that we bought in Songo Tedo, um, so the land that we bought in Songo Tedo, we didn't know that they had flown the coordinates of the land in question. Mm. So the title they showed us as title, by the time we were doing the chatting and the rest of them, by the time we were sending our documentation in, the land in question didn't have a title. Oh. So, you know, uh, what did we have to do? We needed to sell the property as it is. And so we started breaking the land and we were selling. But first, we enhanced value for those locations. We had done a beautiful design of bungalows that we wanted to build. You know, some people had even paid deposit, and so everybody started backing out that they wanted their money back. And time was about 2008, 2009, when in the tick of the global uh, economic recession, the crisis. So we said, okay, if this is where we are at, what do we do? So we picked the houses, the land, and dissected it, laid it out, enhanced the environment, provided security in the environment, gated the area, provided CCTV cameras for the streets, mm. some filled the road, did drainage. And so we now started selling because we also had people we had borrowed from and we needed to pay back their money. So we started parcelating and selling those land at nearly twice what we bought it because of those improvements that we had done. Mm. So we started selling from the fringes. So from the ones we were selling for about 5 million, uh, we closed selling some of those properties for about 12 million. Don't forget the lands we had bought for about 1.8. 2.5 million naira. So that was how we were able to pay our debts. By the time we paid our debt there, we moved further down. We came back to Chevron and, you know, at Chevron we were able to get people who could say, okay, give us land. If you give me two plots of land, when I develop on two plots, I will pay you by four or five months period of time, you mm -hmm. know. So you now started marketing. The initial project that we were supposed to do was supposed to be on six on um, six units in two plots of land. So we parcelated the land into two, we divided it. 
we started the first three units. We didn't even have the money to finish it, to build it. But there was a land that we had, we had property we had sold for someone. And by the time the landlord started quarreling with the man that, okay, he has gotten another man who will pay and refund it. So he refunded back the client. And the client told me, Kennedy, you must give me a house because we're the one who took me to the last landlord. Hmm. And don't forget the part commission the landlord had actually paid me. The landlord insisted on taking back. So, wow. and here was I in the middle. I didn't want trouble and the rest of them. So I approached a particular um, man and said, if you can give me these two plots of land, I have some money, I'll make payment for deposit. So the money the man had refunded towards them was about 15 million there. But then I knew that with 15 million there, we couldn't afford to buy the land. So we bought the first plot of land for about um, 9 million there. So we bought the first plot of land we paid deposit and we designed, we started construction of the first tree. So by the time we were building on the first tree, we poured sand on the road and the road was beginning to open up, you know. Another man approached us that, oh, he's interested in buying the remaining plots. And so by the time we we're selling the remaining plot, we we're selling that land for 18 million naira. So by the time we we're selling that, we now had substantial money to continue on the development of our project. Okay. But the good part was that because I had done those investments in Oniru back then, so I went back to those developments that I had done back in Oniru because I needed to scale up. So I went back to those developments that we had done in Oniru. I started selling those long leases. By then, you know, the, the, the value of the long leases had increased, increased because I was comfortable as a young man. I had a cash flow. You know, that's why I always say that I love income generating assets because even while um, you have tenants in your property, even if you are not around, you realize at the end of, you know, close of each year, you are getting rental income from those properties. Mm -hmm. So I was getting rental income from those properties that I developed. The remaining ones I started selling on long leases. So with those long leases I sold, we were able to come back to that project that we started. We were able to develop and finish the um, the project, the three units that we were doing. So the client paid us, he was paying us. The sibling, a sibling to the client had insisted that, okay, you know I'm the one that brought this client, you will now pay me commission since you are now the one developing. You understand? So I felt, okay, no problem, we are going to pay you commission, it's not a problem. But midway, the client decided that, okay, I have crisis where I'm working, I want to take back my money. Uh -huh. So. We had houses that the client was paying for, one of the units, the client wanted to take back their money. The client's sister had collected part of that money as commission, commission and yeah. she has done wedding and she has located out of Nigeria. So just imagine when you needed to pay someone 30 something millionaire, for something millionaire, and the sister was there sending you a reminder. And I didn't want to break, you know, the trust between siblings. siblings. Mm. So I ended up paying that money. So by the time we finished paying that money, the good part was that we got somebody else who bought the property at a very increased amount, and we did that. So from doing that first one, we did the second one, and then something happened at a particular point in time. There was this dichotomy between, you know, they had an area that was developing, you mm -hmm. know, on the Chevron axis. One estate was developing, and then we had another estate that was not as rapidly developing as the other one. So the one that was developing rapidly, land was being sold for about 40 million there. The one that was developing at a slower pace, land was being sold for about 8 million there. Wow. So now the difference between the one that is developing and the one that is developing rapidly and the one that was not developing so rapidly, the distance is less than 100 meters. No, oh, that's so close. So close. Mm. So. I noticed that and I said to myself, hmm, something is happening here. And everybody wanted to, the moment you are pricing the land, if you say 30, another person will tell you 35. If you say 35, another person, the landlord will tell you, somebody is offering me 40 million naira. Mm. So I said, okay, the reason why this is happening is because everybody knows, has you know, discovered this place as the developed area that there's a huge market for people to come and buy, build and sell here. So why don't we go and create an untapped, a virgin market? And so rather than me sitting down to focus on where everybody was rushing to, 
I understand that in real estate, for you to remain relevant, you must be yards away from your competitors. You must, in your thoughts, look for locations that you can create a market out of. Mm. And the philosophy then for me was that if I can go there and build six houses together, it has become a community mm. on its own. So if I can go to a street that is totally deserted, if I can go and develop six houses there, mm -hmm. I will create a community of its own. So we went to that area and we started acquiring land in that area. And by the time we were acquiring land in those areas, people were wondering, now ah, why is this man, every land that comes, he will buy, every land he will, he will buy. I was even borrowing from the banks to buy in that area because I realized that people would not believe what I can transform this territory to be, you know. And so in that area, you wake up, you see, you know, um, all sorts of animals coming out from different locations. But the difference from the civilized and developed part of Chevron was just inches away. Mm. And so gradually, by the time I did the road infrastructure in those areas, those land that we bought for 9 million, 10 million, 7 million, became what started selling for nearly 35 million naira. Mm. So people began to say, no, there's no difference between this area and, and the next area. area. The only difference is that somebody here is building better infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so as um, development was catching up, we realized that the areas that we had, we had built better infrastructure that we had in the area that was hitherto more expensive. Mm because, you know, we had better planning, you know, so, and that really, really helped me. And from then on, we went to the Orchard Road to go and develop, you know, and by the time we developed in where today they call Berra Estate, by the time we developed those houses, we developed here, there, um, a lot of the areas didn't have, you know, um, good drainage, but we did all of those things. We provided portable water. By the time we did all of those, someone close to me wanted to come and buy a property. And they said, oh, that they wanted somewhere that was cheaper for their staff corporate society. And then, oh, they said, okay, do you have land somewhere? And I remember that we had one land in Orchard Road, and we took them there. And said, mm, it's far. I said, don't worry. If I can develop this area and it becomes what it becomes, we can also transform this area. And so we went there and we started our first set of projects. And so people came and told me, oh, every developer that has developed in this area, they end up going broke. They end up having crisis. They end up borrowing from the bank. They're unable to pay. Uh. So are you sure you want to go and develop in that area? I said, well, I'll go. So, and I went. And by the time we developed the first set of projects, we developed the first set of projects, you know, we did not make profit. We did not even break even. Mm. So, but for me, what I take away from that project was that if people had paid for properties at 21.5 million, 21 million, and they had paid me in full, and the price of construction materials has increased radically, what must have cost all of this? And so, I realized the mistakes that I made. And good enough at that particular point, I went back and picked offer letters from the people we had, the companies that we had lent real estate from. Mm. I tried to study the offer letter and see why did this company end up folding? Mm. If a company was doing very, very well, because in our part of the world, we realized that real estate companies don't even last five years. Mm -hmm. I used to think it was 10 years, but I've come to realize that it's not five years. To see five years is tough. You see the company doing very, very well, and after five years, six years, seven years, you realize that the company is no more. Mm. People have paid money, they don't find their property. So as I asked myself, what must have been the problem why everybody who is doing real estate, the moment you scale up, scale up, and the, the, uh, uh, and the, uh, and the problem lies in the fact that as you begin to scale up, everybody who is around you is trying to create a whole that can, they can benefit from. So no matter the kind of structure that you build, you realize that the man who is in charge of inventory mm. is moving materials. 
you realize that everybody, it becomes an all-commerce game. What can they gain from the company? Hold up. I want to share with you a fantastic feature that our sponsors for this episode, Traction Apps, have. By now, if you are a How They Did It loyal fan, I assume that you already have downloaded the app or opened an account on the web platform. So the feature is called the wallet. Now, when you open your Traction app account, you have a wallet where the monies that are paid uh, through your transactions goes to. Now, this wallet is useful for a couple of reasons. Number one, through the wallet, your cashiers, your store attendants can check transaction alerts. So no more having to call you on the phone to confirm if a customer made a payment or a transaction. They can simply open the wallet and see the money coming within seconds. So that reduces anger from customers who have to wait for confirmation. Number two, you can transfer money out to other banks or to your own account in another bank, right? That is where your funds are primarily held. And lastly, you can buy your airtime. Now, the good thing about buying airtime with your traction wallet is the fact that if you buy airtime, you get 3% cash back. So let's say, for instance, you buy airtime was 1,000 Naira on any of the networks in Nigeria, you get 30 Naira cash back. So if you're buying as much as possible, just know that every time you buy, you get 3% cash back. So check the links below. So if you are yet to open your account and you're a business owner doing business out of Nigeria, you are wrong. Go to the link in the captions, open your Traction app and begin to enjoy all the fantastic features that Traction has to help you grow your business. From all your analogies, you know, on moving from Monero and scaling the business, I hear a lot of deals, you know, spoke to this person, got this, spoke to this person, sold this unit. Um, so I understand that marketing is one of your strengths. You know, how have you been able to market or lead marketing um, for the units that you have developed over the years? What one, two tip do you have marketing wise that has helped you continually sell your properties? I didn't go to Harvard Business School. <laughs> so um, it still boils down to what we have done over the years. You know, we get a lot of referral marketing. Okay. Know, we get a lot of referral. And I would always beat my chest to say that if you once rented any of our Victoria Crest projects as a tenant, you will end up, you know, being an advocate or an ambassador of the company and you most definitely want to buy a unit from us mm. because, you know, the whole experience behind it, you know, when we started the Victoria Crest Service, we said we we're going to make aspirational living affordable. And so what is that aspirational living? We looked at those houses in Ikoyi, in Victoria Island, those flats, high-rise flats that we looked at, it was just expatriates that were living there and we asked ourselves, what did have what can we take away from what they had and give to the middle class mm. and we can hold the market and hold it well so it's the experience so the experience of living in those communities you know and nothing gladdens my heart like when i wake up and i see an image posted on social media mm -hmm. and the background Audio is a victoria person. crest property somewhere you know the experience is if you live in those houses you must definitely want to buy another one from us. Mm. And if you have bought one, you want your dad to buy, you want your uncle to buy. And so we may not have a very bogus, huge marketing cost, but then everybody who has bought from us must definitely bring some other people to come. Mm. Buy so referral us. marketing is huge. Very huge. Um, what, what's behind, why was still marketing? What's behind your strategy? Because for instance, over the years, I've taken interest in real estate. And I've almost never seen a billboard except once in a while where you put it up. Whereas most real estate companies take over all the billboards, etc. So why, how did you decide or why did you decide to go the other side? The opposite of what the market is doing? Uh, well, for me, it's about the cost we put on the project. Okay. So if there's a discount that I can give you, that will make you buy the property mm -hmm. and still refer people to come and buy from us, you know. Because marketing for me, marketing real estate is different, mm. you know. 
real estate is the difference between real estate and practically many other products is that the same i always tell people that the buying the the, the decision making process of buying real estate is the same decision making process that it takes mm -hmm. for you to decide who you marry hmm. it is not when you want to part with your money you are asking yourself should you accept this ring from this man should you accept this deal from this man mm. so it's not the number of times that i've seen your billboard that will make me part with money for you mm. because you want to check well check well check well and be sure and be sure mm. Do you accept the ring from the man that you are not certain of because you have seen him everywhere? Every party that you go to, he yeah, appears yeah. there. Every event that you go to, he appears there. Mm. So you want to be sure that the man you part with your money is the man that you have seen, man for the job. tested, trusted. And when you part with your money, the same way when you part with your yes, mm. you can go to sleep and know that your heart well. is in safe hands. Yo. So, if you will part with your money for me, you'll be certain that your money is in safe hands. Hmm. Because you don't want to part with your money and every day you are running to the site in the middle of the night. Are they building? Are they not building? Hmm. So, that's the story. Um, hello, my name is Dr. Kennedy Okonkwo founder and group managing director of the Netcomo Group, owners of the Victoria Crest brand, Africa's biggest real estate model. So this is to officially welcome you to the Victoria Crest 5. Thank you, sir. Um, this project is on the new regional road. Okay. We started barely about um, two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. We have worked stop it for some time. Um, about 23 units here. 23 units, wow, that's a large community. So what, what are the steps that you put in place to ensure that the quality of your units or your buildings are not compromised? Okay, um, first it has to do with the people. Um, Sorry, we're meant to be walking, right? Okay. First, it has to do with the people. Okay. Um, second, it has to do with the design. And third, it has to do with the quality of um, construction materials that we have utilized. Uh, most real estate companies, they will say that the moment you scale up um, to a large extent, people expect you to use your finis, that you, know, you, you lose, you lose, um, you lose the, the, the the quality of finish in the tiny details. Mm. So, but for us, it's about saying, let us replicate the first model. If we replicate the first model, by the time you keep going there with the processes, you would replicate that over and over. Now what? Uh... Yes, we're working. Mm. Okay. So. Right, so, in action. so most importantly is in the detailing. Mm. Um, the first thing we try to do is to do the sample units so that everybody understands that that thing that we have designed in 3D, we have designed, here we are trying to finish the sample units and we have finished it. Mm. And all of us go back, the team go, the technical team goes back to that unit to appraise it and then look at how functional you know um, our design is, and if there are uh, if there are reasons to tweak little things in um, the areas where you have socket switches or mistakes that may have been made mm. or has, is not really captured during the design, we edit with the sample unit. You know, okay. uh, but most times they are just small things that could have been missed out, such as sockets positioning switches and then the moment that is detailed we're going to do the other units so it becomes like replicating a particular model that we have done mm, okay so there's a lot of structure that is put in place to ensure that um, the units are up to standard yeah fantastic so how are you able to um, get the team to deliver on the vision 
hiring, managing people, whether on site or in the office? What I try to do is to delegate, okay. outsource and coordinate the, the process that they are running. So um, we are able to deliver based on the kind of team that we have assembled because a lot of times you, we don't have quality workmen in this part of the world mm. because everybody who, 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 who is very good can as well be a contractor themselves. doing you know, projects outside themselves. Mm. And for those who are not a uh, contractor themselves, the Japa syndrome has made it very easy for technical guys to mm. find job outside. But we also put in place a lot of incentives okay. to keep them motivated and, you know, keep them for as much as long as they want to stay, you know. And then um, most importantly, we have also tried to um, groom younger ones to um, on the study um, the, the, the seasoned artisans who are working with us, the seasoned engineers who have been working with us so that we don't have a major gap when um, skill gap, skill, you know, skill gap mm. when they end up leaving. leaving. Oh, okay. Um, okay, interesting. Do you have issues of, um, or how are you able to manage theft? Because theft is an issue with large-scale pro projects, and when there are so many people involved, with the thousands of people you have on your sites. So um, there is no formula that fits all. Um, mm. We, we it, theft is a major, a major, major issue mm -hmm. on construction site. It's also a function of the insecurity in the country. So um, and for me, security has a lot to do with people, process, and technology. Okay. So people, who are the process, people technology. and technology? So who are the people that you're employing? Um, who are the people, uh, people who are manning different positions in your organization? Because a lot of times you realize that for, for there to be a theft in the, you know, in the construction sites there must be insider coordination mm. so if you can reduce that to some extent which we try to do um, also we make use of technology CCTV cameras we also have armed guards doing our construction process okay you know we have armed guards you know um, securing our estates you know so that way we believe that to some extent we are able to significantly reduce um, theft. that theft. A lot of theft also occurs during the supply of the materials on site, you know, mm. in a lot of construction company, which like I rightly st stated, you know, starts from inside that coordination. Yeah. So if you're able to checkmate your, 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 re the, the point of receiving the material supply to your site and you're able to manage the inventory properly, you can bring that down to a significant proportion. Okay, great. Um, what challenges have you faced through, you've been in, in real estate for how long now? Over two ne decades? Nearly, over two decades. Over yeah. two decades. So what are the challenges, if you were to pick the top three challenges that you have faced over time, then or now, what would they be? So, um, I'll say finance. Finance. I'll say skilled, skilled workforce. Okay, skilled workforce. And then I'll say um, uh, inflation. Mm. You know, I'll say finance, skilled workforce, and I'll say inflation. Um, finance in the sense that um, to move from to scale up in this industry requires a lot of money you okay. know equipments and their likes and all of those cost money mm -hmm. so just imagine that we need to build um, an estate of a hundred units somewhere and from the point when you started um, the cost of constructing may have been 30 million naira per unit by the time you are finishing the project um, Inflation has eroded the, the margins 
we are finishing those projects at nearly 40 or 41 million naira per unit. Wow. So that affects it. Mm. Uh, interest rate, we are borrowing at, you know, over 20% in mm. this part of the world. So how many percent margin do you expect that a developer will make when they are doing a real estate, you know? Um, quite unlike our contemporaries in more developed climes, where um, financing is at nearly 3% or 7% as the case may be. Now, in the other part of the world, you know, we are running at nearly 25% here in Nigeria at the moment. So finance, skilled workforce because of, you know, the, the currency devaluation going on in Nigeria. It's as ironic as it may be. When some of us started real estate, a lot of Kotonu people were in Nigeria mm. doing many Manual labor, job. doing artisan, doing, you know, um, doing uh, masonry, carpentry and the rest of them. But mm. today, most of them would rather not come back here because their currency is a lot stronger than, than the Naira. Um, the, we're having a lot of um, brain drain in this part of the world, you know, especially for our industry, oh. because um, the Brexit has made it possible that a lot of um, Europeans have left England and, you know, um, a lot of Nigerians are going over there to England to fill up the gap. Mm -hmm. you know, the technical gap, you know, in the construction industry. The construction industry over there is booming and they pay better mm -hmm. than what we pay here. So, you know, a lot of people, you realize that if you ask anybody in our industry, a lot of people are living by the day. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of policy, um, we, we, we don't have policies that support the industry. We don't have policies that support the industry to make them grow. Um, the, 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 a lot of um, incentives are given more to speculators than people who are actually playing more in the sector. So, um, you know, uh, it makes it difficult for us to reduce the cost of construction because if um, we had incentives created to help us reduce our costs, in terms of clearing costs and the rest of them, um, mm. we could do better. So it's not to say that um, local production has not boomed. Uh, local, local manufacturing has helped our industry a lot today because if you speak about the downside, you also speak about the upsides of what has happened. Today we produce, we have companies producing, you know, doors locally, mm. uh, kitchenwares locally. We also have companies producing tiles locally. You know, a lot of local production has started has in Nigeria yeah. over the few years. And, and sincerely speaking, it will continue to get better in terms of the quality that they churn out. Nigeria has a big real estate market, you know, a country of over 200 oh, yeah, million yeah. people. Um, definitely, they are not going to live under the bridge. Like <laughs> you know, so, um, a lot still needs to be done. To be done. There's opportunity in the industry and it will continue to grow. Okay. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in general, and then entrepreneurs that are um, going into real estate? So two sets of people. Okay, um, a lot of money is still out there to be made in Africa, mm -hmm. and so I think Africa still, you know, potents a great deal of opportunities for everybody. Um, I like to go traditional in my investment, and so I would always advise people who want to do investment to weigh the amount of risk involved in the investment in terms of risk and return. You know, um, the riskier it is, mm -hmm. the higher the returns, but the more likelihood of your losing your entire money. So um, I would rather do investments that I am very certain of. And for me, real estate creates that great opportunity. Um, for anyone doing real estate, I would always tell you, start small, mm -hmm. grow big. Um, it's not the size of the project but ensure that you do a project that when you leave, when you 
at the end of the project, you will not have lost what you have put in. Mm -hmm. Rather, you would have gained. So when you go into project, remember that your character is the most important asset you know you would ever have. And so you don't want to end up doing that project and at the end of the day your character is stained mm. because you don't want people referring to you as that person, that man, that woman that they parted with their money and they got burnt. Mm. The question would always be, if we ever get to meet again, would they be proud enough to want to do business with me again? Fantastic. And that is it. Thank you so much, sir, for Thank coming on the show. Time. I'll see you all on the next episode of How They Did It with Trisha Biz. Peace out!